Two is better than too many is leaving Jamaica with too few. The deadly truth behind population control programs by Philippa Davies. This was originally delivered as an Issachar Foundation Jamaica public lecture on May 15, 2019, on the occasion of the UN International Day of the Family. The objectives of the presentation is to provide a brief examination of the history of the population control movement, the Jamaican experience, the local and international impact of this ideology, and to make recommendations for a sustainable response to ensure population stability in Jamaica. Some terms and concepts to keep in mind as we go along in the presentation are birth rate, the number of live births per thousand women, TFR or total fertility rate, the average number of children a woman could potentially have throughout her reproductive years, replacement fertility rate, the number of children a woman needs to have to sustain population levels. Experts recommend the minimum replacement rate to be 2.1 children per woman. Worldview, the lens through which we see the world and respond to it. Everyone has a worldview, although they may not always be aware of it. Every law, every policy, advertisement, or movie has a worldview. My presentation will reflect a worldview. Two main types of worldview. One view says that man or woman is the final authority on what is right or wrong. Another worldview says that there is a transcendent moral and ethical law to which all men and women are accountable. It is important to know our worldview because it is the basis of our beliefs and our beliefs drive our behaviors. Two is better than too many was the slogan of a public education campaign run by the Jamaican National Family Planning Board between May 1983 and August 1987. The campaign included a short drama on the fortunes of two Jamaican women with different outcomes to their lives based on relationship choices made. In one television advertisement, a married woman, Judy Johnson, who has two children, opens the door to find another woman with four children hanging on to her as she begs for some assistance. The married woman is shocked to recognize the destitute woman as Bev Brown, her former high school classmate who was bright at maths. Bev Brown recognizes her classmate and asks, your two kids? Mrs. Johnson replies confidently, yes, that's what I planned to have. Bev looks at her four children and replied sheepishly, that's what I planned to have. The voice of the announcer then says, one had two with a plan, one had too many without a plan, two is better than too many. This campaign was run consequent to the 1983 National Population Policy, whose, state is aim, whose stated aim was to, one, reduce the TFR from six children per woman in the 1960s to four in the 1970s to two by the late 1980s. Secondly, to provide access to high quality family planning services to all Jamaicans of reproductive age to quote, ensure continuation of the nationwide fertility decline. And third, to realize replacement fertility rates so that the population should not exceed 3 million. Policymakers were concerned that, quote, too rapid population growth can have negative effects on economic and social development and on the moral, spiritual, and environmental health of the country. The control of population growth is thus a precondition for achieving improvement in the quality of life of the nation. End of quote. Was the campaign a success? Well, the contraceptive prevalence rate, or how many persons access contraception, increased steadily from 51% in 1983 to 73.5% in 2011. One in two pregnancies was said to have been planned, and the adolescent birth rate re decreased from 137 births per 1,000 women in 1975 to 72 in 2008. And the TFR has decreased from 4.5 in 1975 to 2.4 in 2008, or it had decreased, sorry. 
Local planning experts have welcomed this decline and expect that once the replacement rate is achieved, it will be maintained at 2.1. But this assumption must be challenged. The evidence from developing and developed nations applying similar programs is not drop to two and maintain happily ever after. Fertility rates are falling across the world. Between 2010 to 2015, the 83 countries with below replacement fertility accounted for 46% of the world's population, including China, the USA, the Russian Federation, and Germany. The Caribbean is not exempt. Barbados's fertility rate fell from 2.16 in 1975 to 1 1.79 in 2015. Belize fell from 6.20 in 1975 to 2.64 in 2015. St. Lucia fell from 5.20 in 1975 to 1 1.92 in 2015. According to UN statistics, Jamaica's fertility rate registered at 2.08 in 2015 and is projected to fall to 1.86 by 2030. Falling birth rates is usually accompanied by a rapidly aging population and its indicators, a shrinking labor force, shrinking per capita burden of taxation, reduced pensions savings, greater healthcare demands for old age diseases, reduced investment, slower innovation, and slower economic growth. Japan's TFR is 1.4 and claims that its demographic crisis is so severe that it might eventually perish into extinction. And it had been, has been reported that adult diaper sales are about to surpass baby diaper sales in Japan. In 2015, Italy's health minister stated that her country was also dying. Locano in Northwest Italy was offering to pay couples 10,000 US dollars over three years for them to live in their nearly ghost town on condition that they get a job and have a child. Each year, Locano had around 40 deaths, but only 10 births. The USA's TFR is 1.76 and like Scandinavia, Canada and Germany is relying on immigration to boost population growth. Is this Jamaica's future? To examine when and how the concept of family planning came to Jamaica and became official policy, we need to consider some key historical timelines and personalities. We begin with the Englishman Thomas Malthus, who is credited as the ideological father of modern population control movements. His 1798 essay on the principle of population argued that an increase in food production led to an improved well-being of the populace, but this would lead to population growth that would then consume the increase in food production and undermine the benefits gain. Rather than advocating expanding food production and ensuring equitable access to resources, Malthus, in his faulty reasoning, recommended the control of population growth. He said that positive checks on population were hunger, disease, and war, which raised the death rate, and preventative checks were birth control, postponement of marriage, and celibacy, which lowered the birth rate. The next personality, Charles Darwin, published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. This was published in 1859, and he expressed his idea of natural selection. Darwin also read Malthus and was inspired by their common thinking that the struggle for existence is everywhere, he said, quote, the favorable are preserved, unfavorable ones destroyed, end of quote. Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, expanded the idea of natural selection to humans. He coined the, words, the word eugenics, meaning good breeding, to argue that in order to improve the genetic quality of a human population, Talented, skilled, and wealthy people should marry other talented, skilled, and wealthy people and breed talented, skilled, and wealthy children. 
society should encourage good breeding and discourage bad breeding by untalented, unskilled, and poor people. Eugenics was attractive to some elites and wealthy in the English society. They formed themselves into groups such as the Malthus League and the Eugenic Society, and they set about influencing law and culture. For them, poverty was proof of a lowly evolutionary status. Having large families put the poor on the same level as insects. The only way to eradicate poverty was to eradicate the poor. The eugenicists advocated institutionalizing mentally defective children and adults and the so-called feeble-minded persons whom they considered to be of low intelligence. The eugenicists promoted birth control and sterilization and sex education for the young to groom them towards breeding well. The eugenicists were also the first modern campaigners for the legalization of abortion. In the United States, elite white Americans through state legislatures and courts executed segregation, forced sterilization, and euthanasia, among other actions, against emancipated Negroes, immigrant Asian laborers, native Indians, Hispanics, Eastern Europeans, Southern Italians, Jews, white men with dark hair, hill folk, poor people, the mentally ill, mentally slow or disabled, the infirm, women classified as bad girls or sexually wayward, unwed mothers, and anyone classified outside the eugenic preferences. Financial support came from the Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Institution, among others. Charles Davenport, co-founder of the Eugenics Society in the USA, started the Eugenics Record Office at Cold Spring Harbor, New York, at which he collected data on persons with so-called undesirable physical, mental, and moral traits such as poverty, mental disability, dwarfism, sexual promiscuity, and criminality. The grand plan was to wipe away the reproductive capability of the so-called unfit. This was also the aim of Margaret Sanger, who founded the American Birth Control League. Like Malthus, Darwin, and Galton, she believed in class and race superiority. Quote, birth control itself, often denounced as a violation of natural law, is nothing more or less than the facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit, of preventing the birth of defectives and of those who will become defectives, end of quote. And this included epileptics, illiterates, paupers, unemployables, criminals, prostitutes, and dope fiends, but also the Negro. Margaret Sanner started the Negro Pro Project in 1939 with the support of influential members of the African-American community. It was specifically directed towards poor Blacks in the Southern USA for whom she thought birth control knowledge would be, quote, the most direct constructive aid that can be given them to improve their immediate situation of poverty, end of quote. She also said, quote, the most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. And the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members, end of quote. Mrs. Sanger also initiated and part funded the development of the contraceptive pill. The groundbreaking appearance of the pill is not to be underestimated. This was a drug to be given to otherwise healthy women, not to heal an illness, but to alter the body's natural functioning for long-term use and social purposes. The pill is on the World Health Organization's Group 1 list of known carcinogens to humans with increased risk of cancer in the cervix, breast, and liver. Eugenicists didn't like Christian values of helping the poor. Madison Grant, co-founder of the American Eugenic Society, wrote, The Passing of the Great Race. He said, quote, Mistaken regard for what are believed to be divine laws and a sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life tend to prevent 
both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults as are themselves of no value to the community. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit and human life is only valuable only when it is of use to the community or race, end of quote. Elites despising the less fortunate in their society is not a new idea. The strong trampling the weak is a recurring theme throughout human history. The eugenics movement on both sides of the Atlantic fed into and collaborated with other like-minded groups in other European countries. Perhaps the most well-known was in Nazi Germany. Adolf Hitler said that Madison Grant's book was his Bible. Determined to create the wide master Aryan race, he promoted marriage and reproduction by Aryans, but segregation, birth control, sterilization, eugenic abortion for non-Aryans, forced emigration, euthanasia, and the lethal gas, gas chambers. The targets, the mentally and physically handicapped, gypsies, Slavs, Blacks, social Democrats, Jews, both within Germany and from countries that came under Nazi rule. American business interests, such as the Rockefeller Foundation and International Business Machines Corporation, IBM, contributed to the Nazi regime and profited financially. The IBM Punch Cards technology, a forerunner of the computer, which was originally used for the US Census, was expanded to create a people tracking database. The system was integral for the identification, expulsion from society, confiscation, ghettoization, deportation, concentration, and extermination of Jews in Europe. After the war, the Nazi German experiment tainted the words eugenics and birth control, but they didn't disappear, they were just rebranded. Eugenics became human genetics engineering and birth control became family planning. In 1942, the American Birth Control League was renamed Planned Parenthood. International Planned Parenthood Federation, IPPF, started in 1952. IPPF is the world's largest provider of abortion and contraceptive products. Also in 1952, Rockefeller Money established a private group called the Population Council, whose members were mostly drawn from the eugenics movement. The Ford Foundation was brought in as a co-donor. The target? Reducing the population of developing countries. Ford developed contraceptives such as Norplant, a match six, match stick sized hormonal contraceptive placed under the skin of the upper arm, and the intrauterine device, IUD, a contraceptive device with abortifacian properties, meaning that the contraception can cause abortion. The IUD can cause an inflammatory reaction in the lining of the uterus, which can prevent implantation of a fertilized egg. Rockefeller also worked on political leadership. They convinced U.S. presidents and developing country leaders that population control programs were essential in order to achieve substantial poverty reduction and development. In 1965, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, formally set up an Office of Population. Ford influenced the leadership of the United Nations to launch into active population control programming. The United Nations Fund for Population Activities, UNFPA, was set up in 1969. Significant UN population conferences were held in 1974, 1984, and 1994, at which programs of action for UN member states were created. Family planning was upheld as critical to achieving economic growth in the context of sustainable development. The last step was to convince ordinary people. This meant influencing the personal decisions by millions of men and women about their sexual activity and childbearing, a revolution from below. The target, women. The eugenics jargon was rebranded re again. The language of population was replaced by human rights and women's empowerment. Ford funded programs focusing on women's development issues and the campaign for the recognition of the newly created terms of reproductive health and reproductive rights, which is a euphemism 
for abortion. Ford also contributed funding to Population Communications International, PCI, which injects population control messages of recommended small families into mass media around the world, including radio and television soap operas, primetime programs, and computer games. Walt Disney Studios produced a 1968 cartoon called Family Planning, Teaching the Control Ideology. Also in 1968, the book, The Population Bomb by Paul and Anne Ehrlich came on the scene. They rehashed Thomas Malthus by arguing that more people meant fewer resources, more hunger, poverty, environmental degradation, political instability, the end of the world. They said hundreds of millions would starve to death in the 1970s. 65, 65 million of them would be Americans. Crowded India was essentially doomed and England would cease to exist by year 2000. Well, they lied. It's 2021 and England is still here. The Food and Agricultural Organization, FEO, statistics of 2013 indicated a threefold expansion of global food production over the past 50 years. And today's knowledge economy and creative economy places greater value on human intellect than on land and animals as in early industrial revolutions. In 2015, Paul Ehrlich admitted to the New York Times that he was mistaken in some of his predictions, although he did not withdraw his original arguments, but it was too late. His wrong ideas proved to be, quote, one of the most potent factors in creating popular support for large-scale efforts to control population growth in the third world during the 60s and 70s, end of quote. Let's recap by mapping the spread of ideas. Malthus, Darwin, Galton, Rockefeller, Ford, Sanger, Davenport, Grant, Hitler, Ehrlich. There are many other names, but these are some of the key personalities with the same worldview that some human lives are worth more than others. And to, they weaponize their position of wealth and education and political access or just plain size in the service of a false so-called entitlement to decide who should be born or not, who should live or who should die. Let us now look at the Jamaican experience of population control programs. Charles Davenport of the U.S. Eugenics Records Office in New York wanted to find statistical evidence for, quote, biological and cultural degradation following interbreeding between white and black populations and assess the future of any country containing a mixed population, end of quote. He devised a survey of mixed race populations in every region of the world to cover all Africans, Europeans, Asians, Mexicans, indigenous peoples, and others. Jamaica was selected for an initial two-year pilot because the island had isolated pockets of pure-blooded Negro, mulatto, and white populations of similar economic class. Funded by the Carnegie Institution, the study was called Race Crossing in Jamaica. The researcher collected various body measurements and biodata, for example, face breadth, nose depth, nose bridge, outer and inner angle of eye, hair form, eye color, fingerprints, palm prints, the ability to repeat seven numbers backwards or cut figures out of folded paper, a sense of musical pitch, time, tone, rhythm, answering the questions, have you ever been sick with typhoid fever or pneumonia? What games do you like to play? Do you hate anyone? Do you ever faint? Do you walk or talk in your sleep? At one point, Davenport considered securing data from banks about how much money was in each individual's account and cross-referencing that information against eugenic standards. The subjects were 370 blacks, browns, and whites taken from the Michael and Shortwood colleges, the communities of Gordon Town, Sugarloaf, Mount Industry, and Seaford Town, the inmates of a prison, workers at Kingston's fire and police departments, babies at a creche, and 44 Cayman Islanders. His conclusion was, whites are relatively swift and accurate. 
Blacks are slow but accurate. The browns are slow and inaccurate. He said, I quote, the standard races of mankind are rapidly disintegrating. Those who look to the future are naturally concerned with the question, what is to be the consequence of this racial intermingling? If only society had the force to eliminate the lower half of a hybrid population, then the remaining upper half of the hybrid population might be a clear advantage to the population as a whole, at least so far as physical and sensory accomplishments go." End of quote. The Jamaica project was also the first time that IBM tested its system to track and report racial characteristics. According to Edwin Black, author of War Against the Weak, five years later, IBM would adapt the same technology to automate the race warfare and Jewish persecution in Hitler's Reich, end of quote. Davenport wrote to eugenic societies and individuals across the world, inviting them to identify areas populated by different races of mankind or hybrid peoples. But eventual knowledge of the horrors of the Nazi atrocities led to the closure of the ERO in 1939. Those students of the Maiko and Shortwood colleges had no idea they were being experimented upon in furtherance of a sinister plot to exterminate them and the world of black and brown people. Those Jamaicans were spared, European Jews were not. Then came the real explosion of public interest in birth control in Jamaica. The 1938 labor riots shone the spotlight on the economic and social plight and oppressive working conditions of the poor. But some Jamaican voices, mainly white, colored, and black upper and middle class, called for birth control as a proper remedy for those economic problems. Historian Nicole Bourbonnet has written that many of these voices were in dialogue with international birth control and eugenics movements, and they spoke about the danger that overpopulation, they said, posed to economic development. They recommended sterilization of the so-called unfit, mentally deficient, and chronically diseased, and birth control to contain the breeding of those of a lower stage of mental evolution. However, Roman Catholic and Protestant churches, trade unionists, emerging politicians such as Alexander Bustamante, and representatives of the United Negro Improvement Association condemned birth control as an attack on family life, a sinister move to reduce the Black race, and a distraction from dealing with the real causes of poverty and inequity. The fact was that most of the arable land was in the hands of the white plantocracy, and the British colonial office and the local legislature were unwilling to meaningfully uplift the well-being of the majority Black population. The Jamaican Birth Control League came into being in 1939. A local advocate was Miss May Farkinson. Margaret Sanger herself wrote to Miss Farkinson in 1954, expressing her desire for Jamaica to lead in the region. Quote, I believe that once you have found a courageous group in Jamaica to give support to the progressive idea of family planning, that you would be able to carry on an enlightened and constructive program. As president of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, I write to you as frankly as this, because I am anxious to see the North American region, which includes the Caribbean, inspire courage, as well as lead in progressive scientific educational teaching to the rest of the world. End of quote. Jamaica did lead. Jamaica was the first Caribbean nation to join the IPPF and its eighth member in the world. This was in the 1950s. Jamaica hosted IPPF's second Western Hemisphere Regional Conference in 1958. Jamaica was the first country in the world to receive a World Bank loan for a population project in 1970, targeting maternal health, family planning, and women's education, as well as financing the expansion of the Victoria Jubilee Hospital in Kingston. Jamaica was the first in the world to receive mobile family planning units from USAID. And Jamaica was the first in CARICOM to introduce replacement fertility level through family planning as an official, official government policy in 1983, 
in time for the UN Population Conference of 1984. The Jamaica Birth Control League changed its name to Jamaica Family Planning Association, FAMPLAN, in 1950. The government agency, the National Family Planning Board, was established in 1967, and the National Family Planning Act was enacted in 1970. Activities have included mass media, public education campaigns, especially targeting the youth, and the provision of contraceptives and counseling. Not to be missed, not to be missed is the fact of significant overseas funding. The OECD 2016 data on official development assistance ODA allocations by developed countries shows an obsession in particular by the US in funding population control programs across the world in Eastern Europe, Asia, Americas, including the Caribbean and Africa. These are the primary beneficiaries of such ODI. In the Americas, the US's contribution to water and sanitation projects amounted to 0.2% of the ODI. Other social infrastructure and services was 2.0%, but population and reproductive health was 9.7% of the ODI. This is US foreign policy. The US Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 sets out the primary goals of the USAID. Section 102B4 says development assistance provided under this chapter, development assistance policy, shall be concentrated in countries which will make the most effective use of such assistance to help satisfy basic human needs of poor people through equitable growth, equitable growth, especially in those countries having the greatest need for outside assistance. In order to make possible consistent and informed judgments in this respect, the president shall assess the commitment and progress of countries in moving towards the objectives and purposes of this chapter by utilizing criteria, including but not limited to the following. A, increase in agricultural productivity per unit of land through small farm labor intensive agriculture. B, reduction in infant mortality. C, control of population growth. The USAID website openly states that it's the world's largest family planning bilateral donor. They've been in the business since 1965. It was the USAID that funded the Two is Better Than Two public education campaign in Jamaica. It was under a grant of US $4.9 million over four years to finance projects in family planning. Another significant private donor to birth control programs is the Bell, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In addition to its investment in vaccine development and delivery, the Gates Foundation pursues the eugenic strategy of targeting girls and women with a persuasive but false narrative that birth control is the best vehicle to reduce poverty, achieve gender equality and women's empowerment. For example, in July 2012, at the London Summit on Family Planning, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation partnered with the UK government, the UNFBA, national governments, donors, civil society, the private sector, the research and development community, and others to launch an international effort to make available affordable contraceptive information, services, and supplies to over 120 million women and girls in the world's poorest countries by 2020. Among the donors at the London Summit were IPPF and Population Council. Who's the target? Developing countries, the world's populations of black and brown people, in particular, Africa. The population is growing too fast, Mr. Gates complains. So did birth control actually solve the problem in Jamaica? Well, that depends. Was there a problem? Was there an exploding population problem in 1938 when the birth control campaign started in Jamaica? Or in 1983 with the two is better than too many campaign? Historical statisticians have calculated that Jamaica's birth rates were never very high. Definitely not during slavery, where planters preferred to rely on new imports rather than care for the existing population. In the 1920s and early 30s, underpopulation was a major concern. 
a growing population was equated with geopolitical and economic strength for the British Empire. Population numbers fluctuated also because of pandemics like the yellow fever and heavy migration, especially at the time of the building of the Panama Canal and, of course, the two world wars in which many Jamaicans went to fight for the United Kingdom. Since independence, Jamaica's birth rate has been falling. In 1962, there were 66,900 live births. In 2018, 33,092. Remember what our population policy speculated? That, quote, too rapid population growth can have negative effects on economic and social development. And the control of population growth was a precondition for achieving improvement in the quality of life of the nation, end of quote. But the Economic and Social Survey reports from 1957 to 2016 prepared by the Planning Institute of Jamaica do not cite population growth or contraction as the cause of our economy's improvement or failure. Economic reasons are given. The openness of the Jamaican economy, the fortunes of major trading partners, and international markets, the international monetary uncertainties, drought, painful structural, uh, structural adjustment measures, among others. These are the reasons cited. The fact is that there was and is no population explosion problem in Jamaica. Our economic problems are not caused by the births of babies. The worldview of the activists in 1938 and the framers of the national poly population policy in 1983 was based on the flawed and false ideas of Thomas Malthus and Paul Ehrlich. So if overpopulation was not the problem, is there a population problem? In the 1930s, there were real needs and concerns of women as health services available to working class citizens were less than adequate. Today, maternal health care has greatly improved and infant mortality thankfully has fallen from 60 per thousand births in 1960 to 22.2 in 2015. However, three particular themes reoccur in the 1938 and 1983 discussions. Neglected and abandoned children, the impact of high rates of out of wedlock births, and intergenerational poverty. But neither the birth control movement, nor two is better than too many, sought to address the underlying causes of poor parenting, high rates of out of wedlock births, or poverty. It simply gave an instruction on numbers. But an unwed poor mother with four children and an unwed poor mother with two children is still an unwed poor mother. And a neglected child in Trenchtown or in Beverly Hills is still a neglected child. But as we have seen, the objective of eugenics is never to eliminate poverty, but to eliminate the poor. The objective was always to get poor women to have fewer children. Did it work? Well, we have the findings of a 1988 sample survey of 500 women, 250 from the rural area and 250 from the urban area. They were the target group for the ad campaign, that is women with less formal education from the lower economic income bracket. They were tested on the takeaway message from the Two Is Better campaign. 76 took away a message to plan for your family rather than to have two children only. Why? Well, in their worldview, children were not liabilities, but valuable for the emotional rewards, domestic support, and becoming economic providers for the mother in her old age. In their opinion, poverty was not caused by too many children. Rather, the causes were unemployment, lack of education, being born into poverty, among other reasons. Makes sense, doesn't it? So who took up the message of reducing family size? Ironically, women who were not the primary targets of the campaign, women in a better socioeconomic status. A 2011 World Population Report stated that 73% of married Jamaican women were the main consumers of contraceptive products. Are there other consequences of the population control message? Yes. One is that a shrinking, we have a shrinking child population, which has led to the closure of schools. In 2001, according to the Ministry of Education records, population school enrollment was 334.7 thousand. But in 2016, 
It's 251.9 thousand. It was also reported by the ministry that between, between 2013 and 2015, 28 primary schools closed in different parts of the island. I personally spoke with the administrators of 11 schools. The reasons they gave for the closure were shrinking child population due to fall in birth rates and migration to other parts of the island or overseas. As a result, some of the remaining schools had to consolidate to retain numbers. And some buildings have been retooled for other activities, such as adult skills training facility, or the premises might revert to agricultural use. One administrator said, if you have to close a school, it's a sign that a community is dying. Unless some industry is reintroduced, the support business services that depended on having a school will also disappear. What's another consequence of the population control message? Our aging population. This data provided by Dr. Sharon Priestley from the sociology department at the University of the West Indies Mona campus shows that in 1960, the under 15 population was about 41% of the overall population and the elderly that is over 60 were, was around 7%. Today, the under 15s are 24%, the over 60s, over 60s are 12% and it's projected that by 2030, the under 15s will be 23% and the over 60s, 16%. By 2030, the working age population will reach its peak and thereafter begin to decline. And by 2050, there will be a crossover between the under 15s and over 60s where there will be more six, over 60s than under, 15, under 15s. This would be a major upset to the dependency ratio that is how many non-working age persons to working age persons. The national birth rates include births by unwed teen mothers. And this has been a longstanding concern and the subject of various interventions to have those statistics reduced. But I've heard it said that if the teen, that the teen pregnancy rate is very likely keeping up the national birth rate. Even more tragic is the real possibility that by reducing teen birth rates, it will speed up the crossover to the larger age population than younger population. Where the elderly dependency ratio exceeds youth dependency, it means that there are fewer children to support older parents or fewer workers to support the retired. As life expectancy has extended, older persons are living longer. This raises several concerns. Many children are not physically present to care for their older relatives due to high levels of migration to city areas or overseas. This can result in social isolation and possible financial insecurity of the elderly and increased dependency on social welfare. Local pensions experts have surmised that more than 60% of the population of working age Jamaicans have no form of pension. According to a Gleaner editorial on March 10, 2021, the government-run pension scheme, the National Insurance Scheme, NIS, is, quote, not in good financial health. It needs new and younger contributors to be sustainable. The fund is at risk of a negative cash flow in a decade. It could go broke by 2035, end of quote. Jamaica has a looming pensions crisis. Let's consider the question. Is eugenics still an operative globally and in Jamaica today? Well, it certainly is. I've given some examples. Family planning is part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals of 2015 in which UN member states are encouraged to participate voluntarily. We're not obliged to, but goal 3.7 says countries are to provide universal access to sexual reproductive healthcare services, including family planning, information and education and the integration of reproductive health into national strategies and programs. The Planning Institute of Jamaica has said that our national development goal, Vision 2030, is aligned to the SDGs with similar goals and seeking similar outcomes. The National Family Planning Board still exists in Jamaica and continues to campaign its flawed worldview to the general public and our children that birth control is the best effective response to early sexualization. Family planning is also taught in our schools. Let's recall that the Rockefeller 
Foundation and Ford, Foundation Rockefeller and Ford set up the Population Council, which funded the establishment of the Sexuality Information Education Council of the US, CECOS. This started in 1964. Its first head was a former medical director of Planned Parenthood. CECOS received its startup money from Hugh Hefner of Playboy and developed the Comprehensive Sexuality Education, CSE, which is a sexualizing curriculum that promotes early sexual activity among children and reliance on contraception and abortion. The objectionable sex and sexuality modules that were found in the HFLE curriculum in Jamaica in 2012 and taken into the children's homes in 2014 was CSE. CSE is an educational curriculum developed by eugenicists, birth control and abortion advocates. Eugenics is still being promoted in popular media, such as blockbuster movies. If you saw Avengers Endgame in 2019, you would have been exposed to the population control propaganda. Thanos, the villain, wants to destroy half the universe because of overpopulation and insufficient resources. For several months, this movie was said to be the second biggest movie of all time, earning 2.797 billion US dollars worldwide. Another factor for the decline in replacement level is the fact of increased educational opportunities for girls and women and far greater female participation in the workforce. This tends to lead to later in life marriages and fewer children or none at all. Now, by no means am I criticizing girls and women accessing education. I am myself a university graduate and working woman, but there is a hyper focus on the empowerment of girls and women under the rubric of gender and its various derivatives such as gender equality. But this emphasis is not matched by similar campaigns for boys. I submit that this bias is part of population control. My opinion is that giving equal focus to empowering both boys and girls could well lead to more men in stable work, which might encourage more marriages and wives feeling secure enough to have babies or more babies by taking time out of their career journey because they're being provided for by the father of their children during those early child rearing years. Eugenics is also prominent in the movement to legalize abortion in Jamaica. In 2013, a spokesperson for the People's National Party, Ms. Lisa Hanna, recommended to Parliament to legalize abortion as a crime preventative measure because, in her opinion, poor or unwanted children are likely to become criminals. This is a eugenics argument. To claim that poor people are likely to be criminals and therefore eliminate the poor in order to eliminate the crime is simply illogical and flawed reasoning or rather I should say, eliminate poor babies before they're born in order to eliminate crime is simply illogical and flawed reasoning. Then there was a 2018 motion to legalize abortion brought by Jamaica Labour Party Member of Parliament, Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, which was debated in Parliament between 2018 and 2020. Since 2020, Mrs. Juliet Cuthbert Flynn has been appointed to be the Minister of State in the Ministry of Health. The draft act accompanying the 2018 motion to legalize abortion includes such eugenic clauses as authorizing a medical practitioner the power to abort a baby if the baby would be physically or mentally handicapped or was conceived by rape, incest, or carnal abuse or if the medical practitioner decides on the basis of the mother's socioeconomic circumstances, actual or foreseeable, and the interests of other existing children, that having the baby would constitute a risk of grave injury to the mother. In other words, a medical practitioner is to pass his or her own subjective judgment on whether the mother is fit enough to have and raise children. These clauses rest on the worldview that society should eliminate the defectives, the poor, the so-called undesirables and their future generations simply because one, one set of citizens considers another set of citizens an inconvenience and of, and of no value to society. UK historian and farmer in her book, 
by their fruits, eugenics, population control, and the abortion campaign, points out that although UK abortion activists always cited helping poor women as their motivation for campaigning to legalize abortion, these activists only call for abortion and not the alleviation of poverty or the provision of public amenities. They also knew that reproductive controls were not being demanded by the poor. The activists were aware that sneaking in abortion legislation coupled with harsh economic conditions would then create a demand for abortion, thus achieving their eugenic goal of population control. According to the Center for Urban Renewal and Education in the US, there are stark racial differences of birth control and abortion programs and who they target in terms of the demographics in the USA. Black women have the highest abortion ratio in the country with 474 abortions per thousand live births. Abortion clinics such as Planned Parenthood are disproportionately situated in communities with high black and Hispanic concentration. The 2019 opinion of US Supreme Court Judge Justice Clarence Thomas in the case of Box Against Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky Incorporated weighs into the discussion on the continuing effects of eugenics in US society. On May 28, 2019, the court upheld an Indiana law requiring, requiring that aborted fetal remains be buried or cremated rather than disposed of like common garbage. The court, however, declined to review a lower court's ruling blocking a ban on abortions on the basis of the fetus's sex, disability, or ethnicity. Justice Clarence Thomas used the occasion to reveal how abortion is a furthering of the eugenics goal of Planned Parenthood's founder, Margaret Sanger. He wrote that, quote, the use of abortion to achieve eugenic goals is not merely hypothetical. The foundations for legalizing abortion in America were laid during the early 20th century birth control movement. Eugenics was the most adequate and thorough avenue to the solution of racial, political, and social problems, end of quote. The justice held that if birth control could prevent unfit people from reproducing, abortion can prevent them from being born in the first place. Technological advances have only heightened the eugenic potential for abortion, as abortion can now be used to eliminate children with unwanted characteristics, such as a particular sex or disability, end of quote. Justice Thomas also highlighted that Ma Margaret Sanger started her Negro project because she saw Blacks as a great problem of the South, the group with the greatest economic health and social problems. And this targeting of Blacks continues in modern days, as evidenced by Planned Parenthood's ghetto approach of distributing its services or in distributing its services. Black groups then and now in the US saw family planning as a euphemism for race genocide. Now, it might interest you to know that in a 2012 news article in the Jamaican Observer, it reported the apparent frustration of the local IPPF office, FAMPLAN, that, quote, a significant number of Jamaicans in abject poverty are refusing to use family planning programs, as for some, the perception remained that contraception is a means to reduce the Black population, end of quote. I will now share some thoughts in this final section on steps going forward. At the individual level, it is necessary to be informed on the history of a matter. We should not take a situation at face value. Always ask ourself, ourselves, what is the worldview of this issue? What idea is at work? Is it true? And what are the outcomes of the application of this idea? We need to know our own worldview. What is your worldview about the value of human life, about children? What do you think about reproduction and the continuity of a nation? Are you a fecundophobic, <laughs> a coined phrase to mean an irrational fear of fertility and large families? The question could be asked, can Jamaica reverse its fall in TFR? I, honestly, I don't know. Demographers worldwide have said that once the rate falls below replacement rate, it's really hard to restore. As Singapore found out 
ideas have consequences. That night nation also ran a stop at two campaign in the 1960s, 60s, but then woke up to a crisis of underpopulation. Since the 1980s, the campaign became have three or more if you can afford it. Singapore abolished its family planning board and the government began to offer incentives to parents such as payments for having children and daycare subsidies, priority in school enrollment and housing. However, Singapore's replacement rate remains a dangerous 1.26. Their own officials have admitted that this is a consequence of continuously sowing the idea to its people that too many babies are not good for the economy. The reality is that we can't coerce a couple to have and raise children, and there are real expenses. I dare say that population control is not limited to controlling the actual number of babies born, but to also, it also includes a surrounding environment that makes life either conducive or hostile to having children. So personal income, the cost of living, the availability and cost of childcare services, the availability of maternity and paternity leave, the cost of education, these are among many other factors. But to throw this into the mix, two is better than too many was an idea introduced into our thinking to change our minds about the value of children and the orientation of male and female relationships. Our grandparents and great grandparents are likely to have thought differently about family size, notwithstanding the lack of easily available contraceptives, and they like, are likely, were likely to have had less money than we do. So what could Jamaica do about our population numbers? Let me offer three recommendations. The first one is that we have to be honest about the past, the present, and the future. China's population is 1.3 billion. They practice a coercive one-child policy for 35 years. They now have 30 million men, more than women, because girls were not preferred and aborted. The Chinese government then woke up in a panic, realizing that they need more babies to be born today to sustain their powerhouse economy in 30 years. So the government suddenly ended their draconian one-child policy in 2015 and switched to encouraging the population to have two children. And since May 31, 2021, to have three, the three-child policy was enacted into law in August 2021. Then Iran, with a population of 77 million, the government has stopped issuing free condoms and vasectomies and instead has increased maternity leave and introduced paternity leave. Spiritual leaders encourage worshippers to raise more children for Iran's future. They blame an imitation of Western life for the crisis, but others blame a fall in marriages, a rise in divorce, unemployment, a lack of housing and job insecurity, and extended studying. The Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini said, however, quote, one of the mistakes we made in the 1990s was population control. Government officials were wrong in this matter, and I too had a part. May God and history forgive us, end of quote. Then in Denmark, a population of almost 6 million, the welfare service is strained in providing for a large aging population and a shrinking youth population. One innovative travel agency was inv invited older women to book a sunny holiday package for their adult children so that they would relax, have lots of sex, and make babies. The travel agency invited the wannabe grandmothers to join forces because if their children wouldn't have babies for Denmark, maybe they'd do it for mom. Now these countries have bigger populations and bigger economies than Jamaica, and they openly admit the crisis they're in and are desperate to do something about it. What are we doing in Jamaica? There has been some recognition of the change in demographics, and there's a marginal appreciation that a crisis could happen. But with official replies like, yes, we know the birth rates are falling, but don't panic. It's going according to plan. You have to wonder if this is an ostrich moment. Which plan? Whose plan? If, you, if they're following a group, if you're following a group and those in front of you suddenly turn around and stampede back because there's a cliff up ahead, why would you continue going ahead full steam? Population control is not random, it's systematic, it's not isolated, it's global. 
The situation in which Jamaica finds itself is an illustration of the importance of understanding worldview. Which worldview do you take to work with you? Which one is the best for our nation and would lead to human flourishing? Proverbs, Proverbs 14 verse 12 is correct in saying, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. The truth is, Jamaica is facing a population crisis of our own making. We cannot wait to hit rock bottom to solve it. Pushing back the retirement age and training more health workers in geriatric, geriatric care can only do so much. Immigration will also bring its own set of challenges. Let's be honest, two is better than too many is population control coming straight from the Malthus, Darwin, Galton, Hitler, Sanger worldview, eugenics. It was the first overt attempt by the Jamaican state to dictate to its population an ideal family size. But who says how many is too many? Is it three? Is it 10? And on what basis? The ad campaign was not imposed by law, but it was imposed culturally. I know of married professional women accomplished in their respective careers who had three children, just three, yet they were ridiculed by friends when pregnant with a third child. You're not here about birth control. You have the boy and girl already. Why are you having more? To recover from lies, we need the truth. It is our best and only hope of becoming the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business as aspired to in our Vision 2030, our National Development Plan. My second point, we need to speak the truth about family. The first truth to acknowledge is that before there was government or business, there was the family, and not just any family structure, but the natural family, a married man and woman, and the children of their union. The family is society's beginning, foundation, and continuity. Becoming the place of choice means orienting everything education, economy, and planning towards the good of the family. And everything must become conducive to the bearing and rearing of children. Family is actually the place of choice where the people who are to work and do business are born and nurtured. The fact is that children need both their father and mother in their lives, which was apparent in the two is better than two ads. The image of father and mother together was presented as a better socioeconomic relationship status in which to have and raise children. One ad described as a partnership, which could be married or common law un marriage or common law unions. And another ad specifically qualified the partnership as marriage. I assert that the superiority of marriage over cohabitation or common law unions is consistent with local and international empirical evidence. Children do best when raised by their married biological father and mother in a stable, low-conflict home, and they do best on all indices of well-being, cognitive development, academic performance, physical and emotional health, and economic stability, and future job attainment, among other indices of well-being. It is noteworthy that family planning pioneers in Jamaica, Dr. Lenworth Jacobs and his wife Beth, believed in marriage as the ideal option. They said, quote, the welfare of the ideal family depends on both a father and mother planning and working together for their own and their children's well-being. Jamaican culture is short of stable homes, end of quote. They recommended family planning within a wider framework of education on responsible parenthood, ideally within marriage. In fact, family planning in its truest sense ought to address the full gamut of preparing for a stable family life from learning how to jointly run a household, resolving conflicts in a way that maintains and strengthens the relationship, for example. The Jacobs were concerned to find a solution to the reality of abandoned or neglected children. Contraceptives seemed to be the best stopgap measure, which they called, quote, a prop to support those who are not sufficiently strong to stop having sex they haven't earned the right to enjoy. Contraceptives thus have, at the lowest, saved our island from further unwanted children, end of quote. I submit, however, that there is a danger in compromising because ideas have consequences. Promoting contraception 
birth control as a national response for neglected and abandoned children, in effect facilitates commitment-free, pregnancy-free sex. This undermines the very necessity of commitment, which is in the best interest of children. Easy access to birth control short changes the process of maturity that would have built into boys and girls, young men and women, the qualities of self-control, respect, and consideration of the other, as well as long-term thinking and treating sex with dignity. This is the essence of stable marriage, which is the core of good parenting. By isolating an aspect of family life, sex and childbearing, the birth control movement cheapened it. The massive public ed education campaign made the stopgap of contraceptives the primary go-to for man-woman intimacies. And marriage, the very institution best suited to address the historical concerns of neglected children, high rates of out of wedlock births, and intergenerational poverty, was destabilized. Vision 2030 has been destabilized. Joseph Kearney wrote that, quote, sex is at once man's most vulnerable and yet his morally disciplined area. Eradicate sexual morality, eliminate the strictures and taboos that surround so much of his sexuality, and man becomes infinitely more savage, inescapably more barbaric, end of quote. It is not surprising then that our news headlines scream the consequences of abandoning relationship commitment and responsibility, self-control, maturity, or respect and consideration of the other. The cheapening of sex and the value of human life is reflected in these sample headlines. The destabilizing outcomes of these behaviors is Jamaica's population crisis. Another subversive message within the two is better than two ad was pointed out by Gleaner writer, letter writer, N.J. McCoy on November 9, 1987, when he said that, quote, all but one of the family planning methods were female based and the pressure of regulating family size in the ad was placed on her, end of quote. The message from the ad could be read as men don't have to lead responsibility, don't have lead responsibility for the family. But then society then turns around to cuss off men when they don't exercise responsibility for the family. This brings me to point three, the status of men in Jamaican society, or rather how we see, speak of, and treat the male. It would appear that a frequent message in the media is that male equal wrongdoing. We hear of absentee fathers, the rape and murder of little girls, domestic violence, scamming, and gangs. These all present the males as the baddies of society. I'm, I am in no way condoning those horrors, but it's not the full story. Males are the primary perpetrators of violence, but they're also the primary and largest victims. Professor Herbert Gale, a social anthropologist at the UE Mone campus, speaks and writes about the damaging effects of neglect on the boy child, parental neglect and abandonment, and severe hunger and abuse and torture by their mothers, and the impact of school, dropping out of school, and child labor and incarceration and gang recruitment. Labeling violence by boys and men as toxic mas masculinity is not helpful either. Instead of describing the behavior that is problematic, this label dangerously creates the wrong impression that violence is what men do normally and toxic is a regular man on a rough day. This dishonest statement ignores what goes into the making of a stable human being and the real wounds and complex traumas suffered by boys and men, which cause a pathological response. The mislabeling stifles recognition that he is a person and his life matters too. For society to flourish, both males and females have to do well. One hand can't clap. Here again, the message of marriage is relevant. UK sociologist Patricia Morgan writes that, quote, societies in which men are deprived of their role as providers and protectors may become predators themselves. End of quote. 
In an intriguing study, The Puzzle of Monogamous Marriage, anthropologists examined the historical experiences of societies across Africa, Asia Pacific, North and South America, and they found that societies with high percentages of unmarried young men, particularly from the lower socioeconomic class, was matched by high rates of rape, murder, assault, theft, fraud, gambling, and drugs and alcohol abuse in society. However, Societies with high percentages of monogamous marriages had reduced crime rates, including less rape, murder, assault, robbery, fraud, and personal abuses, and increased savings, child investment, and economic productivity. Hmm. What should be said in Parliament in Jamaica is, Mr. Speaker, marriage matters for Jamaica. I close with these thoughts. It has been more than 80 years since the modern campaign for birth control began in Jamaica. That's 80 years of massive national mobilization of human and financial capital to sell Jamaicans a lie and have us commit demographic suicide. The population control program of two is better than too many is a hollow and deceptive philosophy with disastrous consequences because family planning is planning the stable family out of existence. The real economic endangerment is deliberate population shrinking, not population explosion. In order to solve the problem, you have to honestly identify it. Our population problem is not too many children, but a worldview that cheapens sex and cheapens the value of human lives. My fellow Jamaican citizens, we have a choice. We have to decide which worldview will we live by? Which one will we take to work? And which will we have govern our nation? I appeal to you, please don't let eugenics win. The worldview that is based on the transcendent moral and ethical laws to which all men and women are accountable is the word of God as written in the Bible. God is the creator who made heaven and earth. He designed the human body. He invented marriage and sex and has long, estab long established laws for the good governance of society and human flourishing. If your worldview is based on him, we have hope because his character is good. He is eternal and he says that children are a heritage from him. This is our legacy for national continuity. Psalm 127 says, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that built it. So since it was the Lord who told us from the very beginning, get married, have sex and raise children well, it's a hint that we can trust him for the population numbers and the resources to sustain society. It is his world after all. So let us be pro-family and pro-life God's way. Our future critically depends on it. Thank you for listening.